Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Well, it has been a while since we last visited Alexander the Great. In the last episode, we left off with the Balkan campaigns in Illyria, rebellion in Greece, and the crossing of the Hellespontine. With the ghost of Achilles and the gods appealed to with sacrifices at the ruins of Troy, Alexander was finally ready to begin his invasion of the Persian Empire. But before I continue with the campaign, I need to bring you up to speed on the recent goings-on in the Persian Empire since the reign of Artaxerxes III. Artaxerxes had been ruling since the early 350s, relatively secure in his position on the throne, and with few, if any, rebellions occurring in the empire, things seemed to be going pretty good, all things considered. What disturbed him, however, was the rising power of Macedonia under the king Philip II, and Artaxerxes, using the tried and true technique of his forebears, sought to check this upstart kingdom's power by funneling money and weapons to Philip's enemies in Greece. Unfortunately, it seemed to do little good, because by the last year of Artaxerxes' reign, Philip had begun to plan his inversion of Persia, with the united Greece in the League of Corinth. Artaxerxes would not live to see this portent, because he would die in 338, allegedly at the hands of a poisoning court eunuch named Bagoas. The less juicy version of the story, based upon finds from recent cuneiform tablets, suggests that the king died of natural causes instead. But whatever the case may be, the next few years were turbulent to say the least. Artaxerxes III's son, Artaxerxes IV, reigned for only two years before he, along with many other of his siblings, were killed in court plots and intrigue. Eventually, the throne was passed to one Artashata, who took the name Darius III in 336. Darius was the distant descendant of Artaxerxes II, and was considered a brave soldier and loyal servant to the Achaemenid household, so he appeared to be a fitting candidate for the throne, ironic given his cowardly reputation in the Western tradition. Unfortunately, he also would effectively be the Persians' last true ruler, and crowned upon the eve of the initial preparations of the Macedonian onslaught. Flash forward to May of 334, the Council of Commanders and Satraps had gathered their forces in order to discuss what course of action should be taken to deal with Alexander. Memnon Rhodes, a Greek commander in service to the great king, offered a policy of scorched earth, an attempt to starve Alexander of forage supplies and or delay a pitched battle until the arrival of Darius and his forces. Despite the sound advice, the other Persian commanders universally rejected the idea, partially because many of these lands were the satraps' own territories, and I sincerely doubt burning their own backyard is particularly high in their agenda. There was also an implication that, given Memnon's Greek background, despite any successes he made against the initial incursions of Parmenion in Asia Minor, the Persian satraps were disregarded the advice of a lesser rank. The strange emphasis on Memnon and his skills by the sources appears to be an instance of the trope of wise Greek advisor is ignored by the Oriental despot, so lovingly used in Herodotus and other classical authors. But Memnon would remain one of the key buffers in the initial months of the campaign. With their minds made up, the Persians decided to confront Alexander on the banks of the Granicus River, located some 30 miles east of the Hellespont and north of Phrygia. Our sources give conflicting reports about the exact timing and structure of the battle, but I'm going along with the reports of Arian. Alexander's scouts had scoped out the river and reported back with some concerning information about the depth and speed of the river's course. Parmenion advised Alexander against crossing the river late in the day, instead pushing to encamp and await until dawn for less turbulent waters. In one of the many instances of a wise and cautious Parmenion advising the energetic and ambitious Alexander to no avail, Alex lightly rebuked Parmenion, boldly stating that if he could not ford the puny Granicus after crossing the waters of the Hellespont, he should be utterly embarrassed and the Persians would take advantage of their lack of tenaciousness. Alexander then gave the call and arrayed his battle line comprised of some 30,000 infantry and 4,400 cavalry. Parmenion was in command of the left wing, while Alexander and Parmenion's son Philotas would command the right wing of the companion cavalry division. 
The battalions of Phalangites, Illyrians, Silver Shields, and other allied forces would line between both wings. On the Persian side stood some 20,000 cavalry and roughly 15 to 20,000 infantry, including a division of Greek mercenaries. Tension lay between both sides. The Persians waited for the rush of Macedonian troops, and the Macedonians were anxiously listening for the sound of the war trumpets. Then, Alexander called for blessings from Ares and sounded the charge. Two battalions of Macedonian cavalry were sent across the bank, peppered with missiles, and met with an enormous squadron of Persian horsemen led by Memnon and his nephew. Brave they may have been, but many of the Macedonians were slaughtered, with a few retreating back to Alexander's fold. With the attention of most of the Persian cavalry drawn towards the Macedonian right wing, the infantry battalion successfully pressed forward and crossed the river. To help the infantry, Alexander charged across the mass Persian cavalry. Man-to-man -man combat ensued, with barely enough room for men to maneuver their horses amidst the chaos. Soaked with mud and muck and blood, Alexander managed to reach the opposite bank. Shattering his spear, Alexander beckoned for another weapon from his companions. The king, standing out in his beautifully plumed and crested armor, made a ripe target for ambitious Persian commanders. After plunging his spear through the head of one incoming nobleman, Mithridates, Alexander was struck in the chest plate by a charging commander, Rysakis. Although dazed, Alexander managed to split Rysakis through the middle, but from behind, Another commander, Spithridates, cracked Alexander's helmet with his blade. Under most circumstances, the career of Alexander may have been cut short right there and then. Fortune, however, favored the young king, and when Spithridates raised his sword to slay the Basileos, Alexander's comrade, Clytus the Black, immediately lopped off the arm of the Persian and saved Alexander. Hopping back on his horse, Alex rallied the rest of the troops to push forward, and the Persian forces began to crumble and flee. With victory at hand, Alexander ordered his men to halt the pursuit of the fleeing Persian soldiers. Such mercy would not be given to the Greek forces, though, so who served the great king. Despite receiving envoys for them requesting merciful treatment, Alexander scoffed at the attempts, calling them traitors to their allies in the League of Corinth and breakers of the law. He ordered no quarter to be shown to them, and had them cut down to a man, with any survivors sold into slavery. While understandably furious with the presence of the Greeks, this action would sully Alexander's reputation with the remaining mercenaries in the Persian forces, and would spur other Greeks to continue to fight for and remain utterly loyal to Darius, knowing what fate lie in wait if Alexander got a hold of him. The victory at the Granicus was a close call for Alexander. Arian purports that the Macedonians had lost around a hundred men, 25 of them of the companion cavalry, while most modern scholars would probably triple that number, and Alexander himself had nearly been killed twice. Some modern scholars, like the biographer and Hellenistic historian Peter Green, purports that the Battle of the Granicus was actually spread out over two days, the first part a failed crossing attempt that would explain why Diodorus puts the time of battle in the morning and an Alexander who accepted the advice of Parmenion, whereas Arian and Plutarch pushed for a later evening battle and an Alexander who disregarded Parmenion. Still, it was a great win for Macedonian morale and plunder, and several eminent Persian commanders had died in the cavalry clash. Alex commissioned bronze statues of the companions who had perished, buried the Persian dead with honors, and sent the Athenians a prize of 300 Persian shields and to his mother, much of the drinking vessels and prized purple garments of the wrecked baggage train. Marching south towards the Lydian city of Sardis, Alexander met with an envoy a few miles from the walls of the city. Apparently, word of Alex's victory at the Granicus was enough persuasion to convince the people of Sardis to hand themselves over to the Macedonians. Alexander was pleased and vowed to honor them by allowing them to retain their freedom which likely meant a Macedonian garrison, a tribute, and an overseer. But hey, I imagine that is a better deal than being the smoking ruin that used to be Thebes. City by city, Alexander made his way through the southwestern coast of Asia Minor with little trouble. That is, until he reached the cities of Miletus and Halicarnassus. 
Many of the surviving Persian forces from the Granicus, including the commander Memnon, took refuge in Miletus and set about preparations for defending the city, along with a nearby threatening Persian fleet. Parmenion advised Alexander to fight with his navy, apparently judging it the proper course of action, based upon an omen of an eagle on the shore, implying victory will be won on the sea. Alexander disagreed, reasonably pointing out that the larger Persian fleet comprised of talented sea-going peoples such as the Phoenicians, that it would be too risky. Also, the eagle omen was actually favorable to Alamville because technically the bird was seen on the beach and not the sea. Alexander launched an assault upon the city and captured the interior while his fleet blockaded the harbor to trap the Milesians inside and prevent any outside reinforcements from entering. The city was taken, and Alexander allowed the surviving populace to remain free. Learning from his past mistake, perhaps, he also allowed the Greek mercenaries who guarded the city to also live, on the condition that they enlist in his army. Of the opinion that victory was not to be gained from the use of a navy, but also more likely the enormous cost of maintaining one, Alexander ordered the fleet to disband. Some authors, like Diodorus, postulate that this was also a psychological tactic. With the fleets now gone, a quick escape was impossible. So, the Macedonians had no other option but to push forward. Alexander marched towards Halicarnassus, home to our favorite storyteller Herodotus. Memnon had holed himself in the citadel of the city, and Alex immediately laid siege upon it. The Halicarnassians resisted valiantly under Memnon's command, who frustrated Macedonian progress by sending nightly raids to sabotage and burn the siege equipment. In an almost comical event, two phalangites, who spent the evening getting very drunk, and in an attempt to outman one another, came up with the brilliant plan to capture the city themselves. Shockingly, they almost managed to do it, by inciting a chaotic knife battle in the alarms raised by the defenders, but to no avail. The council of Persians inside the city deliberated on what to do. Aware that time was running short, and that Alexander would eventually break into Halicarnassus, they made the decision to torch the city and flee. Alexander, informed of the plan by a deserter, broke into the inner citadel and managed to slay some of the arsonists before the entire place was burned down. In the autumn of 334, Alexander mopped up operations in Lydia and Caria. In a curious instance, Alexander appointed a formerly deposed Carian queen named Ada, satrap of all the region. She had come forth to surrender herself and her kingdom a few months prior, and offered to adopt Alex, which rather pleased him, and he did not dispute the title of son. After sending some recently married Macedonians back home for the winter, Alexander moved east into the interior of Asia Minor, towards the land of Phrygia. During that winter, it was reported to Alexander that treachery may have been afoot. Alexander of Lyncestis, a suspect in the assassination of Philip, who was the only member of his family to avoid execution, was apparently potentially conspiring with Darius for a whopping sum of 1,000 gold talents. This was confirmed by the portent of a swallow who perched upon a napping Alexander's head. And based upon the assumption that as a sociable bird that was friendly to humans, it meant betrayal, because of course it would. But to be secure, the Basileos sent secret messengers to Parmenion, who was currently back in Sardis, to have Alexander Lincestus arrested and put under guard. In the spring of 333, Alex moved into the interior of Phrygia, meeting little resistance as he traveled along. A famous episode occurred in the city of Gordium, Legend had it that an ox driver named Gordios, a formerly poor peasant who was believed to have been born in Macedonian country, was declared king of Phrygia due to fulfilling a local prophecy whereby the next person to enter the city on an ox cart was to be crowned ruler. And out of respect and appreciation to the gods who blessed him, the ox cart he drove into town with was dedicated to the local Phrygian god Sapassos, equivocated with Zeus. 
The curious part was that the plow was strapped down and wrangled by an enormous knot of unfathomable proportions, with no determinable beginning nor end. Popular belief was that whosoever could undo the Gordian knot would be destined to rule the entire world. Naturally, Alexander was delighted at the prospect of performing yet another mythological feat, especially considering Gordius's alleged Macedonian heritage. He was seized with the desire to solve the knot. Our sources have two interpretations on how the riddle was solved, but both are equally satisfying. One account has him analyze the knot and proceeded to simply cleave the knot in twain with the sword, claiming it is undone, a play on the Greek word luin, which technically means to undo versus to untie, which is what the prophecy asked for. The other story has Alexander simply walk to the cart and pull out the pin that held the knot together, unfurling it upon the ground. Whatever the case may be, Alexander solved the prophecy to great fanfare, and the story of the Gordian knot has become a favorite and famous ex example for artists to depict. And it also became a figure of speech for solving difficult problems with simple solutions, a testament to the quick wit of Alexander. During this time, Darius had given near complete command of the Western Persian forces to Memnon, who planned to invade the Greek mainland to secure sympathetic allies of city-states like Sparta. Unfortunately for Darius, Memnon soon fell ill and died. And in Diodorus's words, with his death, Darius's fortunes also collapsed. With most of Asia Minor secure, Alexander sought to march south from central Anatolia to Cilicia. One day, Alexander thought it best to take a swim in the cold waters of the river Cydnus for some needed R&R. Shortly after, though, the king fell gravely ill. Many of his friends and officers were terrified that Alexander would actually die and many of the doctors were also terrified at the prospects of what would happen if they failed to cure the king. One physician named Philip of Arcarnania volunteered that he was absolutely capable of curing the king and desperately wanted to help. Alex, shortly before being treat treated, received a letter with troubling information. When Philip handed him the healing drought, Alex gave Philip the letter to read out loud, as he drank the potion without a hint of malice or fear. The letter was from Pen Perminian, who had information to believe that Philip was under the pay of Darius, who had promised the hand of his daughter if he were to kill Alexander. Philip was horrified and laid upon the floor, supplicating for Alexander to believe in him, swearing to the gods that he only had the Basileos interest at heart. At first, the drought rendered Alexander unconscious and in all respects appeared dead. He soon was revived by Philip, and as Alexander recovered his strength, he quickly made an appearance to his army, who would not leave the outside of the king's tent out of grief, and a great cheer was sent throughout the crowds of men. Now recovered, Alexander arrived at Cilician Gates, one of the choke points leading through the Taurus Mountains into Syria and Egypt. So far, he has had resounding success, but... Will he manage to cheat death once again and deal with the pressing Persian army on the other side of the pass? Thank you all for listening, and I am sorry for the recent delay in the show. I sincerely appreciate all the feedback and positive responses from everyone. If you like this episode and want to hear more, consider subscribing to me on iTunes and leave me a review. I'm also on Twitter so you can keep connected to the show for any updates or just to hear my ramblings. Links are provided in the podcast description. So, until next time, this has been the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>